Leanne Kamenko, and I'm the global CEO of Geometry. And welcome to Commerce Reimagined. It's our geometry series highlighting change makers, visionaries, and the people who are showing us the way to reimagining commerce in today's very complex world. So for our very first speaker to our series, I would like to welcome Mary Rodriguez. She is an award-winning storyteller, a creative journalist at Microsoft, I met her through being a renowned speaker, um, keynote speaker, I, I call her a kick-ass keynoter, and international thought leader in brand storytelling, uh, personal branding, and youth um, entrepreneurship, So, and I think internships perhaps as well. Um, her previous clients have included Adobe, Discover, Walmart, and McKesson. She's also um, now the best-selling author of her new book, Brand Storytelling, Put Customers at the Heart of Your Brand Story. And today I have the honor to discuss this topic of brand storytelling, brand empathy, and the next wave of where this goes for businesses um, now, especially in the backdrop of what we're all experiencing right now. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much, Beth, Anne, and thank you so much for the introduction. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been an honor, really, to uh, to participate in this interview and, and to answer some questions. So I'm excited to be here. Well, we have to start with the congratulations for your new book being such a huge success. I think it's number one on the media communications category. It is. And it's sold out, I think, on Amazon right now. So if you haven't gotten one yet, you better get in there and get your name on the list for when they come back in stock. I was one of the first to get the book because you introduced it at WPP Commerce in Miami. We're calling it hashtag the last commerce, last conference of 2020. Wow. wow. <laughs> hopefully it won't be. Hopefully we'll see. I hope not. I, the first and not the last, hopefully. <laughs> exactly. So um, my question for you, though, to kick this off is what compelled you to now put your, your ideas and your thinking into a book? Yeah, you know, actually, it wasn't me. I, I was in London at the time, and I was giving one of the talks about uh, uh, empathy. And it was a topic that wasn't readily available to people uh, as a notion of a, a soft skill that we should hone into to do business with. Um, and um, a publisher was there, and they came up to me and said, you know, you need to put this in a book, you need to put this in writing for, for many people to read about it. And I immediately didn't think of the idea. I was like, no, I don't think that that's that I, I don't have enough content for this, you know, and so I didn't say yes immediately, but she really pressed and she really believed in it. And she really believed that the world needed to hear this. And here we are, you know, a couple of years later, and um, so many people are honing into this um, soft skill, into this way of connecting uh, in a time like this that we nobody nobody foresaw. So it was very timely. I think that's why people are hungry for the book and, and for the content. It really is around the notion of doing commerce, doing business, treating our customers with empathy, no longer just uh, thinking of them. Customer centricity truly is being empathetic to customers. Well, I can relate to that, and I also feel like we we, can, we believe the book needed to be written. So, so thank you for that too. And I, I, you know, it's always interesting when you talk about soft skills because the soft skills can actually be quite hard. So sometimes having more of a how-to manual around that it becomes critically important. So we, what we found most relevant for our clients, is, and when we think about it now in this current climate, so we're all trying to figure out how we become most effective and valuable to our clients right now. Mm -hmm. um, this notion of brand story hero and putting your customers at the heart of brand story. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about like from a not obvious trend standpoint? Yeah. What you're, you're seeing right now in terms of good examples of customer centricity and what's at the heart of your book and how it's showing up in today's environment. Absolutely. Yeah, I did a three month plus uh, almost four month research uh, around non obvious trends, trends that show up uh, in, in themes that we're seeing throughout the commerce, the market, throughout social media, through uh, the behaviors of brands and behaviors of consumers as well. Uh, and the um, ideas that came up from there. So this is a um, 
a concept by Rohit Bhagrava, who actually came to Microsoft. I didn't meet him there, but I did see his talk and I did further research about his model. And so I, I, I used this model to create these ideas uh, and these concepts. And what came up was a, a few really telling um, ideas around commerce. So the first thing is that the newer generations, the millennials and Gen Zs and further, are actually thinking more of brands, not only as humans, but as, as friends. So they want to befriend the brand. They want to, um, it's an extension of themselves. If they choose to buy a product, they're not just choosing the product, they're choosing the brand itself. And so brands have to show up with a voice. They have to show up with a stance in society. They have to show up with a purpose beyond their product. Um, and if they don't have one, it'll be really hard for these um, newer generations to connect with them with the way they want to. That's the first thing. The second one, it's around the idea that the, the customer, the consumers, they want to win. They want to feel like they're not being sold to anymore. They know that we're selling them as a brand, but they don't want to feel like we're selling them. And so that idea uh, really comes around, especially in a moment like this. I've had brands ask, hey, should I? Can I, is there space for an ad right now? Should we advertise at a moment like this? And, and the answer is yes. In a sense, there is space for that, but it has to be down back to the, the empathy factor. And that's where the idea of putting the customer first, a center um, in the brand story, in the brand mission is important. For us, for example, at Microsoft, we, we re reimagined, if you will, our whole brand story, our mission. Um, we went from a PC on every desk and every home to empowering every person and organization on the planet. And though both both are truly empowering to the world, I mean, a PC on every desk and every home empowered the planet, um, really actually writing, rewriting the mission uh, and putting the customer, the, the you know, every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, to empower them, it really set us aside and put us as almost a psychic of what I, I call the Robin to Batman effect, the psychic of our own story and mm -hmm. made the customer the hero. That really forces a rewrite um, and the blueprint of how we do business, and, and and it's done it so far for us. So, over the last few weeks, have you seen? Uh, I'll repeat that. Over the last few weeks, have you seen any examples of any brands that you've been like, wow, you know, that just struck that right tone, or that's exactly what's at the heart of what I'm trying to help people recognize? Yeah, yeah. I actually want to mention Corona. Uh, the brand Corona has actually said nothing. The last time they tweeted, I, I believe it was uh, it was March 13th or 11th. I, I can't remember that. I was I was watching what they were doing, and it was really yeah. interesting because their their hashtag, I believe, is uh, live fully or something like that. It's about living fully, and I thought, wow, how how intelligent, how smart of a brand um, is is the fact that they have not uh, said anything. They've been really empathetic to what's going on uh, and chosen to say nothing. And I found it so interesting that I went to the supermarket. And there was not a, a lot of Corona left. So people are actually buying the product. Mm -hmm. And I, so it's top of mind, uh, mm -hmm. even though they haven't done anything. I think that's a great example. Brands that are pivoting as well, their services and, and, their, um, and their goods, to, to to tune into what's going on. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, hotels in, in different parts of the world, especially in New York, who are op opening their doors right now to the medical staff who has to stay there. Uh, so these, these, these really empathetic um, ideas around how we can pivot our own services to deliver something today uh, to people that need it, that will be long remembered. Uh, customers are watching, they this is a historic moment. And so it is okay to go off brand and they should, I believe, uh, to really win in the market because what they do today will be remembered positively or negatively. I love that, you know, not doing something is actually action. You know, yes. it is doing something for your brand and for the community. And that's a great point. And then the, the product is selling because of that. They're being rewarded for that strong choice. Yeah. So that, that's, that's an interesting way of, of calling that out. Um, so at geometry, a lot of our approach is what we, you know, human centric, putting people forward yes. and doing everything we can to dial up the insight and grabbing hold of the data in unique ways to really understand um, what, what motivates people and what makes them buy, you know, what, what would resonate and what what's happening in that cultural context around them. And we also you often use the language or we hear clients use the language um, when you're trying to move from consumers or customers and talk in terms of either people or even humans. And the funny thing, though, about using language like humans is I also hear on the other side of that, well, we're all human, you know, so when you're using it as more of like an adjective or a descriptor, yeah. what does it actually mean to be yeah. human and, you know, to put a human at the core of the brand story? So being more human 
in your mind and in your writing and work, what, is, what does that mean? And um, yeah. what's that role of empathy to get us there? I have to say, I really love geometry uh, for, for that. And I, and I love it because what you're doing is actually practicing empathy on a daily basis. There are three levels of empathy. Um, I found out I was not empathetic myself when I started to do this work. And I was really shocked because I thought I was, but I wasn't. I actually had to take a test, the Clifton uh, Strengths Test, um, that kind of tells you like what your strengths are and not your strengths. And my, I was number, I believe, 33 down on empathy out of 35. So I was like, oh, no, I don't have it. Like, what do I do? And so I I actually quickly learned that it is a soft skill and there's three levels of it that you can practice and so what you're doing is you're practicing cognitive empathy by calling people humans you are reminding yourselves right now whoever's watching this there's a human behind behind that screen and I may not know you but just because I, I can recognize that you're human I you know my empathy level rises when I think there could be something going on. There's statistic about there's always something happening in the background. Um, we're human. There's a human condition. Somebody's dealing with an illness. Even today, I mean, we're thinking about just the impact at every level that we're all having during this pandemic. So, so why you, you know, when we go move away from customers or clients or consumers, we humanize the people that we're serving. Um, and the ethics come in truly around marketing. We remember to be ethical. We remember um, the heart of, of who they are and why and what do they need. And we are more prone to deliver um, any ad, any communication, any content in a way that is centered to their approach, to where they're feeling, to their environment. So instead of asking them to come to us, we go to them with our approach. And that is really the design thinking approach that I share in my book is, is thinking about the five steps. It starts with empathy. Um, and then you define you define your customer base uh, with, from, from that lens. You define the characters, how they're going to play. You take time to craft the, the content, not just create content that you think will land or, or even content that may seem um, that is right now hip or, or the language that we think it's, it's a trend, you can you allow yourself to go off trend if you have to for your own audience and, and you idea, you prototype, uh, you feel fast. You allow yourself a little bit of vulnerability in the, in the process. Um, and it's, it's the way that, you know, we're not used to, but it's, it's a really great approach to fail fast, learn quickly, do it again, recycle it, see what works. And when it does work, it is remarkable what happens because people understand the authenticity behind it. It's interesting that you talk about even personally getting more attuned to your own levels of empathy and, and thinking about empathy as a skill and a skill that's developed. I, I feel sometimes like I was hardwired for empathy and um, really? I, I definitely, I've always thought of myself as empathetic. One thing I learned in my own empathy work was actually not only could it be a strength, but it could actually be a weakness. Yes. So that was an interesting insight for me to have that sometimes, especially as a CEO or a business person, there are times where... Um, you, you have to recognize where it's maybe clouding your ability to also have more objective thinking sometimes when, when that's necessary in a different context. So um, it is interesting to explore all dimensions of how to, how to bring it into the work in a, in a productive way. You're right. And I thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. My son, my, my oldest son uh, is highly empathetic. That's actually his number one on tips and strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're right. Um, one of the things that he tends to do is internalize a lot of the emotions. He feels for other people so strongly. Uh, and so you're actually talking about the second level of empathy. It's a little deeper. It's emotional empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first one, cognitive, is they are human. We recognize their humanity. Uh, the second one is I, we are human. And when you do that and actually get a little deeper than that to the last one which is um compassionate empathy so you go emotional and compassionate when you get to the compassionate level you have to take time um to really consider your own emotions and how they may be blocking or then or how they may be obst obstructing your your uh, your path and so taking time on a daily basis to you know journal to, to think about to release those emotions and actually acknowledge them not necessarily doing anything with them but actually acknowledging that they exist uh, it's a good exercise uh, for empaths like you so just this isn't on our questions that we prepared in advance but <laughs> just to go deeper on this because it's such a fascinating yeah. topic i'm just yeah. curious when you think about in, in a brand storytelling standpoint or yeah. as a communicator, as a business leader, like we just were talking about too, when you're talking to a mass audience, like I'm talking to a global audience at scale, and many of our brands are too, mm -hmm. um, people could be at all different stages or you know have many different emotions that they're bringing to something. Yeah. How, how do you navigate that? How does that work? 
Yeah, and, and that's where what I call the universal truth. So there are themes around the brand story that will resonate with everyone at every level, even through lived experiences, uh, through you know our own intersectionalities that we each bring to the table. Um, I'll give the example of Microsoft as a brand. When we switched our story to empower every person or organization on the planet, empowering became our universal truth. In essence, what that means is all of us in the room, all of us that are hearing this, all of us in the world can can feel empowerment or not. We know what the lack of empowerment is, and I don't have to explain that to anyone. So that feeling, that emotion, it's, an, it's a universal truth. So when, when brands speak to an emotion that we can all attest to, everyone in the room, everyone in their target audience will come together and, and, and understand that feeling from different angles. Of course, we consume content differently. I uh, think of people watching a movie at a theater. We're all watching the same movie. We're all consuming it differently, but we're feeling the same feelings. If there's a, a happy uh, ending, we all get happy. If it's a sad ending, we all get sad. So there's universal feelings uh, that are all human at the core. And that's where the stories are as successful in landing, where we can actually attest to those feelings. Really, really strong advice. So let's move into the mode of sort of measurement of this and, and sure. benchmarks that kind of lead to the metrics and the measurement. Uh, you've mentioned the emotion, the reaction, the lasting action, um, but can, how can brands leverage these, these metrics in a way that's also effective for being seeing storytelling moving the needle for them? Yeah, absolutely. I do want to caution to everyone listening around storytelling for brand storytelling specifically, if you're thinking about this as as um, a way to connect with your customers, it is for the long haul. You're not going to get an immediate, uh, you know, ROI to the bottom line, if you will, because it is an emotional path. It is, in essence, you changing the blueprint of how you show up as a brand, we know the brand is the feeling you give to your customers. So that to create that feeling for the long haul, it's going to take a little while, but you can benchmark the immediate results when you're prototyping stories. And that's why I, I suggest the model for prototype because it's quick, it's low effort. And you can see if you're, if you're doing well along the path, you're kind of directing yourself through it. And I've tested it myself. So it works. Um, and so, so benchmarking really is, is simple. You can attach it to marketing, um, you know, KPIs because truly they, they align to those uh, in reach and engagement, for example, you will get reach and engagement when your story lands well. People will organically share it. I mean, I can't say that enough and stress that enough. It has a content of emotion and we share things that we tend to remember and we want, we want, we feel. So just, just to remind everyone, storytelling, if, storytelling, if you, if you create content in story form, it has the power of being 22 times more memorable than the, any other content you will ever share. So it will be memorable if you make it emotional, if you make it, if you test it in the market, and it, it lands well. And with that, it will also be emotional and people will innately uh, share that. Just like we share songs, just like we share poetry, it is in us to share something that we enjoy, that we connect with. So it, reach and engagement will be, your, will be your first two. I, I actually share an entire chapter on benchmarking storytelling with the idea that yes, you can align it to your typical um, marketing and communications KPIs with the idea again, that this is for the long haul and that you're going to essentially change, uh, I call it culture activation. You're going to culturally activate your brand differently if you head that way. So now let's talk a little bit about the role of technology. So yes. there's not anything that's not underpinned today by technology or enabled in new ways. You're at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. It's playing a bigger role directly in storytelling and yes. it's making us more effective in communications even right now at, during COVID-19. Zoom as a, a new media for telling our stories, right? Getting ourselves mm -hmm. out there and creating so a level of intimacy that we probably didn't have in a lot of our relationships right. before. Uh, so bringing that into um, the sense of short-term, long-term trends that we're seeing, I also think what we've, what we've just been through or what we're going through right now is shortening the cycle. I mean, the adoption cycle of some of the things that we thought were maybe further out are coming in closer. So a, a bit from a futurist view, yeah. what do you see on the horizon and, and maybe Ooh. even a bit pushing us still longer term in terms of what might be out there five years from now or so? Or, yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. I get I get excited and, and to be honest, a little scared just to think about five years from now what that will look like because predictions abound, uh, especially around AI. AI is the strongest, I think, technology that is taking over in many areas uh, just because of the sheer power that it has to think by itself. 
So the idea that artificial intelligence, once it's created, uh, it can just start making those connections. It can start creating those patterns um, and, and really thinking for itself. And what that means is we are, you know, they're autonomous. They're autonomous. And so I actually dedicated a whole chapter. The last chapter in my book is around um, the future of storytelling. I really believe immersing story to, immersive storytelling will take will be the next step. And I, I talk about that because um, we are right now we're thinking about storytelling in one level. Um, and we're, take, we're thinking about storytelling uh, as content or that we can deliver in certain formats or certain channels. The reality is stories and with technologies that are coming in will enable us to immerse ourselves differently, 3D and even 4D uh, in the commerce space for consumers. Think of it that way, uh, this way. When you, we can use uh, our own phones to, before I even go to the store, if there will be a store after this, there's so many, <laughs> so many questions around things that, you know, the entire um, idea of business and how it's done. But if, we, if I want to go to the pharmacy, to the store, um, you know, if I carry a device that tracks me, for example, um, the store will probably have a technology that knows I came in, that knows I'm an existing com a customer, that knows uh, what I typically buy. And before I get to the aisle, it may even have someone stalking it or even a robot stalking it before I even get there to make sure it's there when I get there. Uh, it, the kind of ads that, that I'll be looking at will be customized to me. Hey, Miri typically buys hair products. Let's, you know, once she gets to the store, something will pop up and say, hey, Miri, you get 20% off shampoo. And so it's now a customized and immersive experience where I'm integrating technology and I'm talking to machines, if you will, to get that experience. So I, I really believe that immersive technology, uh, 360 video was kind of like the, the beginning of that. We're getting into HoloLens now. We're, get, we're getting into smart buildings and smart um, rooms and smart houses. We have Alexa, you know, and we, there's jokes about kids talking to, you know, to, to Alexa because it's part of their day. They just have this assistant next to them and that has always existed. And so it's really interesting to see how in the next five years this will um, come to be. Um, predictions around AI is that they will be five billion, not million, billion times smarter than us in the next five years. So that's yet to be seen. But truly what we're seeing with COVID is a lot of things that we thought were essential are not. A lot of things that we can do with technology, we can, and we, we're proving it right now. So that will absolutely enable the next step into technology for the next five years. So I have a, a quick piggyback on top of that one. Okay. The first is we've been using the old adage of um, um, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's to your point. First of all, a lot of this technology existed. We just didn't necessarily have the immediate value for it in our lives. And so we weren't paying attention or sure. it wasn't in the forefront the way now brands have been able to push it out there or adopt it very quickly to meet a, a real need. Right. Um, the, the other thing that I was curious about is... Um, where do you see the human being in all of that? I know I, I spent a lot of time with Alibaba and some of the other commerce marketplaces and platforms that have been yeah. moving faster with artificial intelligence, especially mm -hmm. because they're in nations that are huge, dealing with sure. populations that are huge. And so to be able to do something at scale, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence has really helped them to mimic a lot of what we were talking about earlier in terms of humanity and the things that we think of as being real human touch. So what, like, what's the balance, in, especially when it comes to storytelling between artificial intelligence and machine learning and the technologies and then the human being? What, yeah. what do you, where do you see the roles playing out? I see an incredible piece of our humanity going back to creativity, going back to ingenuity and going back to the empathy level. Think, for example, about machines such as cars. Uh, cars were undoubtedly uh, built by men. Uh, and for men, and in the essence that when they, when you even test them in crash dummies, uh, these are men, men looking crash dummies, They're, the frames are men. Um, and when women that are typically smaller in frame will get into the wheel, we, we have to push our seat all the way up and we have to, you know, get up close to the wheel because we, there's, we, we don't have the space that we need. And so when you think about the actual impact of that, when you think about a biased machine that has been built with biases, um, mm -hmm. The, the impact of that could be that the woman, because she's so far near the wheel, if she crashes, the, the airbag may not have time to deploy on time. So we will probably hit our head and, and you know, something could happen. Um, and that's, that's the impact of bias technology. And the reality is we are biased as humans. So where I see AI combined with storytelling, which drives empathy in our cycle with commerce, 
is men and women who are coding these machines, who are creating, if you will, because we're creators, we're innovating with this technology, we're going back to the the empathy level of where does this machine sit? What is it going to go do? If it goes into education, how does it enable um, intersectionality and people from different educational levels? It's not a one size fits all. So where the technology goes, it, it, it has the potential to be less bias if we become more empathetic to humanity as a whole. And so I think the opportunity here for all of us in the next digital transformation. So I think COVID absolutely helped a lot of companies push through the trans digital transformation that they probably weren't taking that step yet and now they are. And the next phase of that will be machines will take over a whole lot of operational logistical work and we get to sit behind it. And if you code empathy, if you will, in it, a human heart, a human approach, because they are thinking if they're on, on their own once we, once we create them. So if we insert that idea, I've actually read um, uh, articles around machines helping us even be more empathetic. Uh, machines asking questions to say, hey, Neri, did you remember to call your mom today? So, so if we do that, they will do that for us and they will keep us human, the irony. So last question, um, we think about the long-term, obviously, as you said too, and it, we know it takes a long time to build the equity around brands, especially when it's about purpose-driven storytelling. Yes. Uh, we work with Unilever and they've been on this from the inception of a lot of their brands. It's just built into the brand. And we're seeing now that those companies have been able to draw from that equity. You know, they're, they're able to more authentically, if you will, sure. put communications out there in a time like this in a way that does resonate with people. Are there any favorite examples that you have in terms of brands that you've been following for years that have just been so consistent about how they show up? So I do love Marriott. Marriott is one of the brands that I enjoy, not to, not just because it's, um, you know, I travel a lot and I use a lot of different brands. So it's not my favorite uh, that I always choose, but I do love how they've enabled technology and storytelling uh, to really connect with their customers. Um, as soon as, you know, you get to the, before you get to the lobby, they know you've checked in. Um, they'll send you a text and say, hey, um, is there anything you need? Can we get you extra water, extra towels? So they do take an extra step uh, approach to connecting with you uh, through technology, which I love. Uh, it doesn't seem choose it. Uh, it was surprising the first time they sent me a text and I was like, oh, this is nice. Uh, but it's really, really kind. Um, and what I love that they're doing now is they're taking time, for example, to send emails, consistent emails to their customers, uh, people that they have in their database and, and reminding us what it was to travel with them and that we'll travel again. And so they're using this idea of like, hey, this is temporary, uh, sh shedding a little hope to the idea that we're, we're gonna get out there again and, and it's gonna get back to, uh, you know, going back to hotels and enjoying uh, some kind of normalcy. And I love that. I love that because they're not selling anything and they can't sell anything right now, but what they're selling and what they're really showing at, at the same time is, is the experience. They're reminding you that they've created experiences and that you have them again. So I think they've done that really, really well. Um, I love NASA just in general. Uh, NASA, I think, has done a great job. And of course, they don't really sell things, but they do. I think they sell um, science and I think they sell technology in, in the way that they actually, they have an entire team dedicated called NASA Social to Stories. Uh, and what they do is they talk to, um, you know, they have the astronauts go in and talk about their own personal stories. So I really love that they had astronauts uh, talk to us about being confined, being quarantined, because they spend time uh, in, you know, in the uh, in the International Space Station for, for years uh, and, and months. And so the empathy there is around Hey, we get it. We've been there. We have to, we've had to train to be in confined spaces and it's okay. We survived. You're going to survive again. So I, I love that. I love that because people tune into those messages of like, you know, um, this is a brand that typically is so out there. They go to the moon, they do all these things, but we forget what it is to feel like to go to the moon. You're going to have to be in a space for this long. And now we're feeling this. And so that feeling again uh, comes through and we remember. We remember what it is. We're looking at them differently. They look human. Our, the astronauts look human. So I, I, I think they're doing a great job. And Nat Geo, National Geographic, I think is doing a terrific job. Um, they've always done a great job when it comes to their uh, storytelling through photography, especially on Instagram. They're doing a great job in, in, in reminding us what the world is like today. Uh, they each photographer um, goes on there to tell their own story of where they were in the moment. It, it just, uh, you know, again, Earth is beautiful. It's a beautiful place and it's a beautiful place we get to enjoy. So once again, it's the nostalgia that we're getting uh, and the reminder that this too shall pass. And I think that's important. 
there are great three themes that I think all brands could figure out how do they intersect with their own their own business and their own storytelling. Mary Rod Rodriguez, you are just a special charm for all of us. I like to think of you as sort of a conductor of a symphony of storytellers. Oh my gosh, <laughs> thank you so much. I I really uh, I am passionate about this because I truly believe in it, and I will have to say. It's, it's changed my life. I've had to work through this myself. I, as I said, I'm not empathetic personally, so I've, I've become more now. I'm on that trend of becoming an empath and it has changed my life in the way that I do business, the way that I do relationships and, and the way that I connect with people. And it's, it's absolutely something that we should truly hone into. So for everybody out there that is interested in more information on brand storytelling, this is the perfect time to purchase your book once it comes back on. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but please go look out for brand storytelling, put customers please. at the heart of your brand story. And um, you can find her on LinkedIn at Mary Rodriguez. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn at Beth Ann Kamenko, again, global CEO of Geometry. And we look forward to more of these conversations, both with you, Mary, and um, with the audience on reimagining commerce. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.